Classes in Polymer Dynamics, based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 4, Electrophoresis. I'm Professor Phillies, and this is 597D, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics. What I'll be doing today is to discuss electrophoresis. Uh, in the lecture yesterday, we discussed a charged particle in solution and the electrical forces that actually act on it, a list that is slightly longer than you might have thought from a naive treatment. from a naive treatment of electrostatics. In particular, if we have here a charged particle, the obvious force is QE, the direct force on the charges itself, but that's only a moderate part of the total. If the particle is charged and in solution, it has counter ions around it. The counter ions are going to be subject to an electrical force in the opposite direction because they have opposite charges. And because they're being dragged in the opposite direction, there are two things that happen. First of all, the counter ion cloud around this object is distorted so there are more negative charges here than there, and that creates a, a direct electrical force on this charge. Second, these ions are all moving. They create a wake in solution, a hydrodynamic force, and that also acts on this charge. To make life even more interesting, someplace out here are the walls of the container. And the walls of the container will be typically be charged positively or negatively, not always. And if the walls have positive charges on them, they have charges because they have counter ions in solution. The counter ions right at the wall are subject to the same electrical forces that these ions are, flow off that way. And if there's a flow at each wall, the fluid in between is obliged to float along. And that's the usual notion of hydrodynamic boundary conditions, namely, at a wall, you typically have what are called stick boundary conditions. That is, the velocity of the fluid at the wall is the same as the velocity of the wall. Here, however, we have a complication. The thing that functions as a wall the ions are moving with respect to the glass, and the fluid sees the ions and floats along with the ions at the wall. Now you might ask, how can we show that this effect and that effect and that effect are all present? And there, you can do a series of different experiments which vary separately how important <coughs> each of these effects is. For example, if you're interested in the behavior of the ions and the wall, if you didn't believe my claim that this electroosmotic effect exists, there are two ways to change it. One is to take some molecule that sticks to the wall and changes the wall's charge. For example, you could put down on the wall some molecule that is negatively charged, reverse the charge on the wall, that means the counter ions are now going to be positive. The counter ions are now pulled that way. And the direction of the electroosmotic flow is reversed. Furthermore, if you said, gee, what if I attach to the wall a polymer? A polymer that sticks to the wall in part and sticks out in solution for some distance also. In that case, these ions are surrounded by polymers, and while they try to move, the momentum they dump into the fluid is grabbed off by the polymers and is dumped directly into the wall. And as far as someone out here is concerned, riding on a, a solvent molecule, there's no longer any 
driving flow to drive electroosmosis. And therefore, by moderating, by changing what you do to the wall coating, you can change the electroosmotic flow. This turns out to be an extremely important issue in engineering, biotechnical engineering aspects of doing separation of DNA. You can change this flow and therefore you can enormously in, improve the efficiency of a column of, this is basically a plastic tube, a very small, thin, narrow plastic tube, which we're seeing only a little bit. We can enormously change the efficiency of the column by being clever here. You can also change the charge and radius of the probe. You can change the amount of salt you put into solution, which has effects on this boundary layer. We won't go into that. And therefore, there are bunches of experiments you can do to confirm that this picture, which I have greatly oversimplified, honest, is basically correct. Okay, so that is a picture of how the forces act in electrophoresis. Now in the last lecture, which the video will go up probably today, um, there's a technical issue. I have to do multiple video conversions, and even with a very fast computer, we are talking about hours of compute time to get the video from our pretty camera up onto YouTube. Uh, however, we talked about models, and we talked about how you could calculate electrophoresis. Forgot my eraser for a sec. In any event, the picture I gave showed three sorts of physical models for how you could describe a charged object moving through a polymer solution. The charged object could be a sphere or it could be a polymer itself. And one set of pictures were based on entanglement treatments. And you imagine the mesh is being crisscrossed and our moving chain, which is charged somehow, having to find holes in this transient mesh through which it could advance. A second set of models were hydrodynamic models. And there are several classes of hydrodynamic models, but the major issue is that you have a polymer object or sphere which is charged and moving this way, and neighboring polymer chains like these translate and rotate and therefore interact with chain that's moving through them. I am being very imprecise in the details of how they translate and rotate. I also noted Oxton type models. Um, Oxton obstruction models are actually rather similar to these However, Oxton talked more about spheres than moving spheres than moving polymer coils. Uh, also, the Oxton model treats the obstructions as just sitting there permanently. And this model makes the entanglement models, the Dijen models, make allowance for the fact that these crisscross polymers chains are also polymers. They also perform diffusion. And therefore, this lat uh, lattice of polymer chains is transient. It comes and goes in some sense. The Oxton obstruction models make a fairly specific prediction for how the polymer matrix affects the electrophoretic or other mobility. Namely, there is an effect e to the minus a concentration of the matrix to the first power radius, that's a little more complicated than it sounds, of the moving object to the second power, and molecular weight of the matrix to the zero power. Why is radius more complicated than it sounds? 
Well, let us go over to this picture, which is already set up. These are polymer strands. They are not lines. They are objects of a physical radius. So there is one polymer strand. We say that this polymer strand obstructs the motion of the sphere if the sphere tries to move through the strand. The distance that counts, though, is a sum of the radius of the sphere itself and some sort of radius of the polymer strand, because the center to center distance includes both of the thicknesses. And so this is a center to center distance. If the probe is decently large, it's much bigger than the thickness of a polymer strand, and this is approximately probe size squared. But that's imprecise. And if you make the pr probe small, you actually have to think about this carefully. The m to the 0 is the requirement that the polymer strands are very long relative to the space, the size of the holes. And if the polymer strands are really very long, it really doesn't matter how long they are because you never see their ends. That is an argument which the first time you hear it sounds a little odd. Why shouldn't the molecular weight matter? And the answer, in a sense, is here is a polymer strand which is really very, very long. And the sphere, the moving sphere, sees this gap in here. Suppose I cut this polymer strand in half, change the molecular weight by a factor of 2. Almost never will I cut the strand here where it makes a difference. Almost always I'll cut it out here. Yes, I have made a small change in the average hole size because the hole, one hole here has gotten twice as big. But almost all the holes are the same size they were before. Um, that is a, an issue which you sort of have to internalize. You should realize that I haven't said which of these models is correct. I've just said, if you go to the literature, you can find these models. I promise. Okay. So, we are now ready to advance into chapter 3. And chapter 3, in large part, discusses the use of polymer matrix solutions where the thing doing the sequent, the um, providing us with the probe are what are called DNA restriction fragments. So what are restriction fragments? I'm not going to go through all of the chemistry, but I want to show you what's going on because it's actually a brilliant triumph of human science. Here is a really long DNA or RNA molecule. It, like all polymers, it's composed of monomers, and no matter whether it's a DNA or RNA, there are four distinct monomers. All of the biological information, well, until recently when people started talking about methylation, folding, is to some extent contained in the sequence, the ordering. And a huge biological project which came to fruition a decade ago was determining the sequence of DNA in the end, the sequence of the DNA of the fellow who was running the project. Um, when I was your age and an undergraduate, or a bit younger, people had, synth had sequenced one transfer RNA. Transfer RNA is really, really tiny by comparison with the human DNA. Uh, it was an enormous project involving large numbers of people. It was a brilliant feat of extreme hard work. And the comment was made that as long as this is the method, no one's ever going to do it again. But people found some answers. And the first answer is what is called a restriction enzyme. And what the restriction thing does is to cut the DNA. But it's very clever. 
It only inserts cuts at exact points, as opposed to something that just goes in and chops it up like a chainsaw and cuts it up at random. This only cuts it at exact points. And so you can take the DNA, big huge DNA, and you can break it into pieces, which are fairly long, and you can then use electrophoresis even to sort out and isolate pieces of each type. And there are then methods for making many, many copies of the pieces of each type. <coughs> And then what you do is to say, well, we will chemically, one approach is to say we will chemically protect one end so that nothing happens. And we will somehow go in and we will digest, chew up the enzyme, chew, using enzymes, we will chew up these chains from the other end. So every chain has the same end here. This is one DNA piece. But after we're done digesting it, there are little short pieces that end here. There are long pieces that still end here. And now we very cleverly attach to this end what is usually used as a dye, a fluorescent dye. There are other things you could do. And the fluorescent dye, which I will simply label as red, green, blue, I'm not telling you the actual colors, has the feature that which dye attaches depends on which of the four monomers is present at this end. So I've produced all of these strands. They all end in exactly the same place. They have all different lengths. And I have color coded them depending on what letter is here. I will now give a spelling example. This word corresponds to this chain. It always ends at the same point. However, I have gone in with dyes for an English alphabet. I need slightly more dyes than four of them. And I have tagged them so I know that the fifth letter out is an H, and the fourth letter out is an E, and the third letter out is an L, and the second letter out is an L, and this letter is an O. And I can now read off, hello, isn't it clever? However, there is one step which I have skipped. This is just a mixture of all of the different lengths of chains, all of which are color-coded. And what I have to do is somehow identify the fact that it is the five-length chain that has an H, the four-length chain that has an E. So how do I do that? I take an electrophoresis column that I have filled with polymer solution. I drop the mixture of all these in. I apply an electrical field. They migrate to the other end. But because they migrate at different lengths, and I can tune which are fastest and which are slowest, The O at this O comes out first, and then the stuff with the L on it comes out next, and the L, and the E, and finally the H. And I can do this by tuning. You remember I talked about surface coding and such not. I can tune which order things come out on. The important issue is the, sl the smallest or the largest come out first, and I've done a sort. In the condition, why? Because I have this stuff in the column that selectively retards everything, but it's more effective at retarding the little ones than the big ones, or vice versa. I happened to write this so you could read the word, so that it slows down the little ones least and the big ones most. And that's the experiment you're going to see that Baron does in her 
papers, but I could have done it in reverse order. But this way you can read hello. And we start out with H E L L O all on top of each other in one little lump, and we apply a field, and they, as they migrate, these migrate faster than those. Now you might ask, and this takes us into the pa paper, why do you need the polymer? Why don't you just fill this with water? And the answer is, if I have DNAs, different size. They're different sizes, so they have different charges on them. Big ones have bigger charges, so there's more force on them, yes? Mm -hmm. But the bigger ones also experience more hydrodynamic drag. And the net result is that all of these restriction fragments migrate through pure water at about the same speed. And therefore, if you did this column experiment, and you just had the column filled with water, there'd be no separation. You'd put them all in together, and they'd all come out together at the same time, because, yeah, there are different electrical forces on them, there are different drag forces on them, and guess what? Those two effects cancel. So, if you just knew about electrophoresis in water, you'd say you couldn't separate DNA at all, and this approach wouldn't work. Fortunately, this goes back to the centrifugation lecture, lecture two. It was discovered 50 years ago that if you put a polymer into solution and do centrifugation sedimentation, the polymer selectively retards some materials relative to others, and you can do separations in polymer solutions that you could not do in plain solvent. So far as I can tell, that fact was actually forgotten for 50 years. And what actually happened is, people wanted to do electrophoresis, but if you do bulk electrophoresis in tubes this big across, you're passing an electrical current through water, you get heating, you get convection, and because you have convection, things are mixed and you don't get separation. And one fine day, this goes back 45 years maybe, not quite as far, someone said, let's do the separation, and instead of doing it in water, we'll do it in a gel. And gels, well, they're sort of solid, there's no sediment there's no convection there. Gels give you separations you could not get in plain solution. However, chugging ahead toward the present, if you try to load a gel into a little plastic tube, how do you do that? It's a solid. Well, the general answer is you make the gel in place. And so, or you have something which is a liquid at one temperature and a solid or solid-like, highly viscous at another. And there are things you can do with this with block copolymers that are successful. And there are real cross-linked gels which you can try to make in the tube, but they tend, when they ma you make them, they tend to be non-uniform. They tend to give you gas bubbles. That's very bad. They give you all sorts of problems. And someone along the way said, well, let's not use a gel. Let's use a polymer solution instead. Because polymer solutions are just liquids. They flow just like water. Well, they may not flow quite as easily, but they flow. And so you use a polymer solution, and that is the, the, that is the answer to the problem. OK. So we now chug ahead to figure 3.1. And figure 3.1 is on page 46 in the book. And what do we see in figure 3.1? Well, it is a plot of the mobility, how fast things move per unit applied field, as against polymer concentration. And if the... Um, <coughs> 
polymer concentration is zero, you're looking at a semi-log plot, so zero is not actually in the figure. If polymer concentration were zero, everything would migrate at the same rate. It does, experimentally. But as you increase the polymer concentration, you discover that the mobility drops. Furthermore, the mobility of a small object drops less than the mobility of a large object. So far so good. And the figure actually shows this for a bunch of different size objects. And if you look at that, you discover that by the time you have a restriction fragment with 23,000, I think it's 23,130 base pairs. Base pair, yes, this is DNA. It's two strands of polymer wound around each other. And, and it has... Hmm? A with G and an A with T. Correct. So, for example, if you have an A here, you have a T there. And I'm being kibitz and told, reminded, if you have a C here, you have a G there. And therefore, the length is determined by the number of pairs. This is actually a fairly fat molecule because this is a very complicated structure. But it has a length. And the length is usually labeled in base pairs. You can take, have things that are quite short and are still some number of base pairs. The data there doesn't show it, but people look at things that are short as, say, 10 base pairs, and they still want to separate them. OK, so there is, there is the experiment. And then the anomaly, or perhaps anomaly, crops up. If you view the correct description of polymer dynamics as the entanglement picture, there is a feature known, or molecular property, M sub E, the molecular weight between entanglements. That is, if you just throw polymer strands into solution or into a melt, they don't wind around each other like two earthworms. Instead, they go around, and every so often, I've just drawn the every so oftens, they do something that creates an entanglement. The nature of the something is not specified in most of these theories. And there are people who will say, well, it's not really a something at discrete places. It's a mean field effect that we can describe this way. But this distance can be quite large. In a melt, no solvent at all, for polystyrene, this distance might be 10,000 Daltons of polymer, 10,000 AMU, which means it's something like 100 monomer units. If you dilute the polymer, the distance between entanglements is said to go something like 1 over the concentration. I'm using phi, the symbol for volume fraction. So if you're at 10% weight of polymer, instead of being 10,000 per polymer, 10,000 Daltons between entanglement points, you might be 100,000. Please do not take these numbers literally. They're sort of approximations. Uh, the important issue is, the distance between entanglements is quite large. And as you dilute the polymer, the distance gets bigger and bigger. Because the strands, instead of there being strand, this polymer along here, seeing neighboring polymers that fail to entangle everywhere, this polymer just sees solvent and then polymer. Well, if you keep diluting the polymer, eventually something happens. And what happens is we have diluted these polymers a great deal. And eventually, the distance, nominal distance between entanglement points is longer than the length of a single chain. And suddenly, each chain is only entangled maybe once or not at all. 
So if this chain is entangled here, the distance along this chain to where you would expect the next entanglement point is out here someplace, and, the, and the, this chain is only entangled once. And there's no, or not at all, and there's no longer a mesh. Okay? So if you dilute the polymer solution enough, you go from entangled to non-entangled, there is a transition concentration called C star, which is the concentration for entanglement. Oh, obvious feature of C star, which I will let you think about. Suppose I have polymers of several different weights, molecular weights, several different lengths. Is C star the same for all of them? Let's all think about that for a second. I'm seeing a head shake. No. Well, hmm? Okay. Well, let's try a picture here. I have diluted the polymer until the mean distance between entanglement points is that. So here is a large polymer, and it entangles. Here is a shorter polymer. It barely entangles. Here is a short polymer. It isn't long enough to stretch between two entanglement points. Of course, the entanglement points are random, so I'm just saying average distance. And therefore, C star, the transition concentration, depends on your polymer molecular weight. The longer the polymer is, the more you can dilute it and still say the polymer is entangled. However, these experiments, figure 3.1, are all done with the same polymer. And therefore, for that polymer, there is some concentration below which the polymers do not entangle, because they're not long enough. Well, if this mesh picture, entanglement picture, of why you are getting separation is correct, namely if the polymers are long enough, they should form a mesh that does all this filtration, then if you're down here in dilute solution, there's no mesh, and there should be no separation. And having not been there myself, I infer from the review articles that there was a period in which people knew that this was a fact, and did not try experiments down here. And one fine day, Annalise Barron, who was, who was the author on that paper, actually did the experiments down here and discovered a very important result that you still got separation down here in dilute solution. Excellent, superb question which the camera will not have picked up. Why? Well, we will get there later in the lecture if I talk fast enough. But the short answer is, short answer, here is a DNA, and here is a single polymer strand, all by itself. We're in very dilute solution. And the DNA is moving this way under the influence of the electric field. And the DNA can snag around the polymer strand. And while it is caught on the polymer strand, the drag on the DNA goes up. Yes? However, the shorter the DNA is, the less likely it is to hook up with a polymer coat random polymer coil. And therefore, the long, poly the long DNAs spend lots of time like this. The short DNAs spend less. And as a result, the long DNAs are more do or slowed down than the slow DNAs. Now you might ask, is there any way of confirming this guess? And there is. At least there is for really big polymer chain DNAs. Really big DNAs 
DNA is an extremely long molecule. If, if I, we were to take the DNA out of one of your cells, we are not talking about something 10 nanometers long. We are talking about something that would be long enough, but not wide enough, to see with the naked eye. Well, if you have good vision. And therefore, if you do photomicroscopy, video microscopy of a DNA undergoing electrophoresis, this appears later in the chapter, you can actually see the DNA molecules as blobs. If you w take video pictures, you can watch the blobs migrate along the screen. And if you toss in a polymer, suddenly you see a, con a DNA conformation that looks like that. Gee, well, the, pol the matrix polymers are invisible. You can see that, how, oh, that's a good question. How can you see a DNA molecule? After all, it's only a few angstroms wide. And the answer is that we have our DNA, and we have dye molecules that will intercalate or will otherwise bind. And dye molecules have the property that if you hit them with a laser beam, they will fluoresce and they will glow in the dark. And because they are glowing in the dark, the DNA sits there and gives off light. You can't actually see the DNA because the resolution of the optical microscope is quite limited relative to the tiny width of the actual molecule. But you can see the glow roughly where the DNA chain is. But another question is how can you distinguish the different, the different uh, molecule of the DNA with the dyes? Um, the DNA is at very low concentration. Uh -huh. And so if you look in, in the field of the microscope, there are only a few of these. And therefore, you can see, tell there's DNA. The matrix polymer, which is something chemically quite different, does not bind dye at all and is invisible. So if you, this dye will not let you distinguish different molecules. It just lets you see them. Now, what happens if you watch this conformation is called a J. Um, and if you watch a bit, you discover two things. First of all, everything moves. And second, the long end of the DNA pulls the short end of the DNA around. And as it is described to me, what happens is the DNA has encountered an unseen obstacle here. It drags the obstacle along, but it also pulls off from the obstacle and drops back into that conformation. Depending on the concentration of polymer, you see conformations that are described like that. You see conformations that are described as being more like that. Why would you see something more like this? Uh, the concentration of matrix is higher, and there are more obstacles, all of which gather there. Why do they gather there? Well, Imagine my fingers are two polymer molecules. They can slide over each other and there's essentially no friction. And therefore, as the DNA moves this way, the obstacles are dragged in the other direction and pile up at some location. I gather if you work hard, you can act also see conformations that look like that, where there are two obstacles on the same chain. And if you crank up the polymer concentration enough, the matrix concentration, and you run up the electric field enough, something dramatic happens. What is called the I conformation. If you run up the electric field enough, the DNA no longer looks like this or like that. Instead, it stretches out, it's a little irregular, and it just proceeds head first through the solution. And when it proceeds head first through the solution, the mobility 
now more or less, not quite, let's call it epsilon, independent of the length of the DNA, and you can't do separations anymore. So if your matrix concentration changes, you move from this linear regime where you get, we'll get to linear in a bit, get separations to a different regime where you don't. But there is direct evidence that you could actually, the as we come back to the why, and I said the why is that strands grab each other. This is Lisa Annalise Barron's interpretation, and her interpretation is can, can be confirmed in part experimentally because at least for very long DNAs you can actually see the strands grabbing each other. Yes. I have a question. Is that assumption that the polymer solution is now being charged? Let's say it's neutral, right? The matrix polymer is neutral. It's neutral. So that is a, means the electric field not back down there, and it will uh, have some kind of uh, resist it with the DNA moving in the electric field, right? Yes, the DNA is trying to move with respect to the um, matrix polymer, which is neutral. Uh, now you have to be a little careful. The matrix polymer is neutral, but the electroosmotic effect I described causes the entire solution, including those neutral matrix polymers, to chug along in one direction. And therefore, if you actually do the experiment, you have your capillary that you're observing, and you need reservoirs at each end because there will be some net flow of this neutral solution from one reservoir to the other. In fact, that's how electroosmosis was originally discovered. The Russian who discovered it applied an electric field to neutral water and discovered that if there was a clay membrane in the way, suddenly you got flow even though there should be no electric force on the water. Okay? So, we have discussed 3.1 and this discovery that was extremely surprising if you believed in the entanglement pictures. If you believed in the hydrodynamic pictures that I've described, the result that I just described is not at all surprising. It's exactly what you would have expected. However, as you will discover yourselves in your professional life, when you are doing experiments, it is often the case that your mental model of what should be happening tells you which experiments are worth doing and which are obviously totally pointless. If you have a good mental model, those expectations save you a lot of work. But every so often your mental model isn't quite as good as you hoped, and if you do what looked like a pointless experiment, you make a remarkable discovery, which is exactly what happened here. Okay, figure 3.2 shows the same data. Figures 3.1 and 3.2 have all these data points in them, and up to some plotting limitations, they're exactly the same, except for one detail. In figure 3.1, I plot mobility versus concentration, and each line is a probe of a different size. In figure 3.2, I take the same measurements and I plot the electrophoretic mobility against the probe size for probes at a given concentration. concentration 1, concentration 2. But in figure 3.2, we see something quite remarkable, namely, mu versus c chugs along as we increase probe size, and then there is a probe size above which almost nothing happens. And there is a transition probe size. Now, how can these two figures both be the, uh, the same measurements? Well, 
a fixed concentration here, a line like this, corresponds to all of these measurements. A fixed probe size here corresponds to measurements with a given probe. If you did a three-dimensional plot, you would say these two figures are two-dimensional slices. If I had a plot, concentration, probe size, mobility coming out of the board towards you, someday there will be holographic blackboards and we'll be able to do this. Yes? You realize this is, a, this is a figure at which we take slices like this and the mu curve does something in space out here. But I'm taking slices as I vary the concentration for different probes and I just plot them on here. This figure, I am taking slices at fixed concentration and the mobility is doing something as I change the probe size. So I am showing you two-dimensional slices in two different directions of a three-dimensional plot. Uh, there are a few slightly tricky features of 3.2. In particular, if you look out here, there are things that look like straight lines. Now that figure has something linear in mu here and log p there. And that should tell you something about what the shape of those lines are. Except those lines, if you put down a straight edge on them, are not actually exactly straight. And these lines are, in fact, mobility proportional to probe size to some power epsilon, where epsilon is very small. It's not zero. If epsilon were zero, those lines would be horizontal. They're not horizontal, but epsilon is something like 0.1. Okay, so you ask, gee, what is that transition? I, the first answer is that transition is extremely annoying if you're trying to do experiments, because out here, the mobility changes very little with probe size, if the probes of different sizes all have the same mobility, you can't separate them very well. There are experiments, I'll put one of the author's names on the board, Mitnick. And the experiments tend to indicate what the transition is. And what happens is that if you measure mobility versus applied electric field, so we have the velocity, the migration velocity is the mobility mu times electric field E. If E is small, mu is just a constant. But if you increase the field and increase the field, at some point, and it's quite sudden, the mobility starts to depend on E. You have a transition between a mobility that goes as E to the zero power independent and mu proportional to E to the sum, it's some fairly small power. This is a transition from a linear transport property to a nonlinear transport property. Nonlinear meaning you change the, the driving force, whatever it is, and the response changes, but not linearly in the change you made in the driving force. The transition observed by Mitnick appears in its properties to correspond to this transition. I have not found anyone, I suspect it's someplace in the literature, there's a huge biochemistry literature, where someone has confirmed that that transition and this transition are the same. However, the prop behavior that Mitnick found as to where this transition occurred as you change the matrix concentration, 
as you change the matrix molecular weight, as you change the probe size, this transition and that transition seem to be the same thing. Also, they both appear to be, and I am being somewhat weak on making this claim, appear to be the same as the transition from seeing J conformations with large probe particles to seeing the I conformation. And it is reasonable, to, it is straightforward to see why this transition would give you non a sharp change and nonlinear behavior because the way this object moves through solution and the way this object moves through solution are fundamentally different. I shall make an aside which is a general statistical physics comment. Um, there is a lot of statistical physics and physics behavior done on systems where you have linear behavior. For example, Ohm's law, which you all saw in way back in high school physics, if you can remember that far back. And Ohm's law says the current is linear in the applied field. But if you crank up the electric field enough, you get nonlinear behavior. There are lots of transitions from linear to nonlinear behavior, and a lot of them are hard to study because you really have to whack the system pretty hard to get it into a nonlinear behavior. Here you have a system in which you have a linear to nonlinear transition, admittedly in a rather complicated system, and you aren't really pushing very hard on the system at all. In fact, this is very gentle, and you get the change. Um, and therefore, it, as a physics problem, it may be interesting to study because you can look at linear to nonlinear transition under conditions where you aren't worried about the wires melting or what all sorts of other odd effects that occur in linear to nonlinear in other cases. Also, if you were clever and you could push the linear to nonlinear transition that way, these curves would continue down for a while before you got to the transition. And if you could push the transition out that way, you could separate a larger range of DNAs with a single experiment. Well, there's one obvious way to do that, if you believe this interpretation. You just turn the electric field down. And if you turn the electric field down, the transition does not occur because it's not the chains aren't being driven hard enough. Those experiments have not, that I have seen, been done. But as I say, there is a huge biochemistry liter literature, and the smart money says they really have been seen, and I simply haven't found them yet. Okay, so that is uh, the behavior of DNA as a function of probe size and as a function of concentration. And there was already a big surprise, namely if you said DNA was being separated because you form an entanglement lattice. Curves shouldn't have behaved like this. They should have behaved sort of like where at low concentrations, nothing much happens. And at some place near a C star, you get a transition and the polymer mesh starts slowing down big chains more than little ones. Let me emphasize, I've said there's this transition from no entanglements to entanglements. There are almost no calculations that examine the question of how sharp that transition is. And so you could say the transition is fairly sharp, or the transition is somewhat diffuse, and therefore while I drew this as a line, maybe I should have drawn it as a band of some uncertain width, and as you pass from here to there, you, the effect sets in, but it doesn't just turn on like a fluorescent lamp turns on. However, if you're significantly below here, the prediction is there should have been no separation, and that's what, not what occurs. Okay, I have talked about electrophoresis. Question? Um, on the top of the picture, there are linear lines. Why does this? The four lines. Uh, which figure are you in, please? Uh, figure 3.2. 3.2, there are, at the top of 3.2, the open circles, 
school in your life? Yes. Okay, what, what are we looking at at 3.2? Well, first of all, the circles are DNA in pure water. And if you have DNAs of different size in pure water, their mobilities are all the same. And therefore, at very low concentration, we're here, and at very low concentration, there's no separation at all. If we increase the polymer concentration a little bit, you get, for example, the black circles. And in fact, the black circles do fall off very weakly because at very, these very, very low concentrations, you still get some separation. And then we get to rather high concentrations. And first we see this, it's actually a stretched exponential, fall off with concentration, with probe size, I mean. And then as we make the probes bigger and we're at high concentration, we first get a stretched exponential drop and then we get this very slow power law drop. Okay? Okay, let us shove ahead to page 53, figure 3.7. And 3.7 looks at mobility as a function of M, the matrix molecular weight. Remember, these are experiments where we have a neutral polymer and a DNA. And because we have both a neutral polymer and a DNA, the neutral matrix polymer has some molecular weight M, and the DNA, the probe, has some molecular weight P, and these two are different from each other. And what we do in that figure is to look at the question of how the probe is slowed down by polymers of different molecular weights and how it's slowed down by different polymers. The important thing you can carry away from that figure is most obvious in figure 3.7c which shows the quite large probes and several different molecular weights of one polymer. And what you find there is that as you change the molecular weight of the matrix, you change the um, mobility of the probe. So we can say that the matrix, the matrix affects the mobility of the probe. The probe mobility is a function of the matrix molecular weight. And as we make the matrix bigger and bigger, it is more effective at slowing down probes. Of course, at given concentration, it also gives us solutions that are more and more viscous, and therefore harder and harder to load into the capillary. There are a series of challenges, experimental challenges here, which are not completely trivial. And a choosing a matrix polymer that has one set of attractive properties may give you problems at a different point. You then have to try to optimize. Um, have we seen this discussed before? Yes, go back to my discussion of matrix polymers. And I made the point that once the matrix polymers went on for huge lengths, I'm now drawing huge long matrix polymers Matrix polymers that are much longer than one of these hypothesized holes. Once the matrix polymer is really big, <coughs> it shouldn't matter how big it is. As the holes are small, the matrix chains are long. And if, for example, you randomly chop the matrix chains up and change their length, you will always, almost never create change the size of this hole. And therefore, there, was a, there is a model expectation in some models that the mobility should be more or less independent of matrix molecular weight until the matrix gets really, really short. I mean, if you make the matrix short enough in terms of this model, and you put in huge numbers of cuts, suddenly you don't have holes and lattice anymore. You just have single chains. Well, 
This prediction or expectation, I'm not sure if prediction is a too strong a word, this expectation is not sustained by experimental measurement. The mobility is not independent of the matrix molecular weight as you can see in these figures. Okay, let's push ahead to 3.9. And 3.9 shows you a clever thing you can do with modern biotechnology. Well, it's a clever thing you can do if you have some very smart people, and they work very hard, and they know exactly what they're doing. Here is a typical DNA molecule. However, you can make synthetic DNAs. And if you are very clever, you make a synthetic DNA which forms a cross like that. And the reason it would do that is each of those four elements has a different DNA, has a different GCTA sequence on it. And you have arranged the GCTA sequence. These, these are experiments by Saha et al. So this is the only way they can cross match. And the reason you have these arms out here is these arms correspond to a virus DNA, or which has the interesting piece that it has an end, which is only single stranded. And suddenly, you can take the virus DNA and you can make what is basically an X shape where the arms of the X are very, very long. This is a star polymer. It's 190,000 round number base pairs. But the star polymer has the interesting feature that all of the arms are exactly the same length. And all of the stars are the same size. That is, the star polymer is extremely monodispersed and it's huge. And you can compare the mobility of the star polymer with the mobility of a linear polymer of very, very nearly the same molecular weight. That's an important feature of biomacromolecules for doing polymer physics. DNAs can be made. So they're extremely large, and they're extremely close to the same molecular weight. If you use synthetic polymers, like the matrix polymers we've been talking about, you have the complication that the synthetic processes, if they work hard, the polymers are all within a few percent of each other in size, or 10%. Uh, in a DNA, when in figure 3.1 and 3.2, there's a reference to a chain of 23,130 base pairs. That's 23,130, not 23,131. It really is 23,130. Now, it may get broken up a bit, so there will be a contamination of shorter bits. But the piece that is this large is really exactly this large. And you can produce macromolecules whose molecular weight you know to, well, one part in 10 to the 4 or better. For all sorts of physics studies where the, the properties may change with molecular weight, this is incredibly useful. And now we look at figure 3.9. And 3.9 shows electrophoresis of two, a linear and star DNA of the same molecular weight in two different matrix polymers. There are four lines in two pairs. In two pairs, we have plotted here mobility versus polymer matrix concentration. And each pair of lines are pretty much on top of each other. You would be extremely enthusiastic in your confidence in your measurements if you said, those are my measurements, and the, the two lines in a pair are actually not on top of each other. Within experimental error, in each matrix polymer, the two DNAs, 
the linear DNA and the cross DNA of the same molecular weight move at the same speed. Okay. Well, that raises some interesting questions because there are models of polymer dynamics which say linear chains move one way, star DNA, star polymers cannot use that mechanism of motion, they must use other mechanisms of motion, and therefore star molecules should encounter much more resistance as they move through a polymer solution relative to linear chains. Now there's some technical issues which I may get into in the next lecture as to whether that observation is relevant to that figure but what you are seeing is that the mobility of linear chains and stars for electrophoresis for really big polymers are practically identical. Very important result. Okay. I am going to skip section, or almost skip section 3.5, electrophoresis of denatured proteins. I will tell you why it's significant, and then we will skip. And the issue is, suppose you wanted to purify, separate proteins by molecular weight using electrophoresis. There is a problem, namely, they're funny shapes and they have surface charges, and there is a solution. Here is a polymer, here's a protein, and it, ha it is cross-linked with sulfur sulfur bridges typically, so it's even locked together. But what you do is you take the protein and you reduce these bridges to SH groups and you put the protein in a carefully chosen detergent and the protein molecule unfolds. And the detergent, it's a soap, makes micelles, there's a micelle, and the micelles stick to the protein surface somehow or other. Yes. And because there are micelles stuck to the protein surface, this is a sort of uniform object. Well, it's statistical where the micelles are. And the charge per unit length is a constant. And the length is determined by just the molecular weight of the protein. And if you do electrophoresis of this, in a gel or a polymer solution, you can separate them because you've straightened out, so to speak, the protein. And that was a big biochemical advance once upon a time. And it's still very important. Okay. And now we advance, and we're going to talk about a slightly different set of electrophoretic experiments. So far, I have been talking about electrophoresis of DNAs, which are sort of long, floppy molecules. Really short DNAs are very rigid. They're rods. But you could imagine putting something else into the solution, if you know enough physical chemistry. You could put a colloid into solution. So here is a colloidal sphere. This is a polystyrene latex. You could also use non-denatured proteins. You could use viruses. There are all sorts of things. People have used intact biological cells, very large objects. And you could drop this into a matrix solution. And you could add a polymer matrix and do electrophoresis and ask how fast these things move as you change the properties of the matrix. It's the same experiment as before, but now my probe object is a sphere. And the measurements we're talking about go back to experiments due to two people. I am not going to sort out literature further than that. They actually did these experiments. <clears throat> now the experiments are actually important for another reason. <coughs> One of their papers cited one of my papers. And because I used the web of science search that I've told you to use for your 
major homework assignment incoming. I found the citation and I looked at the article and suddenly I realized that here is an alternative method of studying polymer solutions. I knew about the sedimentation experiments, those I'd known about for a long time. But I didn't, it never occurred to me you could use electrophoresis the same way to do physical studies of the neutral matrix polymers. It never occurred to anyone else that that was the case either. If you look at the review articles I've told you to look at, or if you look up books on um, polymer physics um, and polymer solution dynamics, you will find a bunch of physical experiments methods mentioned, different methods, but one method you will not find discussed is this one, because there was no recognition, well, until my book anyhow, that this was a technique for studying the matrix as opposed to a method for studying the probe particles. Well, it is a method for studying the matrix, and here are people studying the matrix with spheres. Figure 3.14 which is on page 65, does a comparison which I do not have for DNA. And so we have plotted this way the concentration of the matrix polymer. And one thing they did was to measure the viscosity eta. And the viscosity is the resistance to pouring. The larger the polymer concentration, the more viscous the solution becomes. And so they measured the viscosity. This is actually log eta. The increase is not quite a simple exponential, that's a curve. And then the authors also measured the electrophoretic mobility of several different probes. Now the complication is that if you use probes of different size, their charges are different, so the forces on them are different. However, the charges are about the same here as there, and if I plot mobility in pure water, as a normalizing factor, so I plot mobility over mobility in pure water, we would expect the mobility to fall as the polymer concentration increases. I'll turn this upside down, and I have 1 over the mobility, which is something I expect to be proportional to the solution viscosity, because it's proportional to the resistance of the up that the particle experiences as it moves, and I will normalize that by the mobility in pure water, divide out the charge of the spheres, and I discover different spheres are retarded different amounts by the polymer solution. But there's a trick, and there's a trick which I found so surprising, I have checked the paper several times, and it's definitely true. These are the smaller probes, and these are the larger probes, and it is dramatically the case that as the probes get larger and larger, the polymer solution is less effective at slowing them down. Okay. Now, why might this be surprising? Well, you can find in the literature, it's related to the entanglement models, people who will say that if you make the probe really big, really big relative to the polymer molecules, there's a polymer molecule, there's another one, they could actually be quite concentrated, but I'm drawing them so you can see one. The probe would see the polymer solution just as a continuum, because the probe is big, these things are tiny, and they're almost as tiny as solvent molecules relative to the probe. And therefore, really big probes would see the polymer solution as a continuum. And because they are seeing it as a continuum, um, their motion should be determined by the macroscopic viscosity. And the expectation then 
the opposite of the experimental data, is that for really large probes, the probe mobility would just be determined by the viscosity. Well, that is not at all what you observe experimentally. It just isn't. Okay, questions at this point? Okay, now we're going to do one last bit of polymer physics. And it relies on some statistical mechanics that you probably have not seen in complete detail. So I will sketch the result. And the result is called either the fluctuation dissipation theorem, or it is called linear response. And the math is very complicated, but the net result is supposed to be fairly simple-minded. Here is an object sitting in solution. And I apply to it a very weak force. If I apply to it a very weak force, it moves, admittedly, slowly. And the velocity is proportional to some constant. I'm sorry, I should set that backwards. The velocity is proportional to the force divided by some constant f, which is a drag coefficient. And if I apply a very weak force, there's a drag coefficient here, which is just a number. So far, so good. Now, suppose I instead have the same particle doing Brownian motion. Brownian motion is what gives you diffusion. It's, in fact, what gives you diffusion even if you're talking about a al metallic alloy and ions moving from lattice location to lattice location. It's a very general phenomenon in materials. The object moves, and the driving force, it's not a force dimensionally, is the thermal energy KT. And there's a resistance to this driving effort where there is a drag. And what linear response tells us is that this coefficient and that coefficient should be the same. So that the drag coefficient that co determines how fast diffusion proceeds, and the drag coefficient that determines how fast really weakly driven motion proceeds, those two should be the same. This is known as the Stokes-Einstein diffusion equation. Very classical result. Now, why is this interesting in this case? Well, the re interest in this case is that in order for these two drag coefficients to be the same, that's sort of, I'm supplying you with that result, the method the mole object uses to move when it's being dragged through solution and when it's doing random diffusion through solution must also be the same. Okay? I mean, if, it used one, if, the, if, if the object used one mechanism of motion when it was being dragged by this force and another when it was diffusing, there'd be no reason for the two Fs to be equal except by accident. Okay? So, suppose we take a DNA and we put what we think is a very weak field on it, so we are in the linear regime. In that case, the mechanism that we see the DNA using to move must be the same as the mechanism that the DNA uses to move when it's diffusing. Of course, there's an if there, and it's a very important if. I said you have to use a weak field. And it is often the case, or sometimes the case, that if you are in a nonlinear regime, it's not really linear, you get a pseudo-linear behavior and the velocity 
is locally linear in the field strength, the driving force, but you're not really in the very weak field regime. You're in some other regime where you also see what appears to be linear behavior. Also, if the numbers don't change very much, you can often put a straight line through data, even if it really isn't straight, and your conscience should be telling you the data isn't really straight. Nonetheless, let us suppose people have actually observed DNA moving in the weak linear field regime. Well, there are people who have done video microscopy, the references are in there, and they observe DNA is moving through matrix polymers in what, so far as I can tell from the papers, appear to be weak fields. What do you see for linear DNA? If it's in the linear regime, you see conformations like this, the J and the V. You can also get a transition to a, V looks more like that, a transition to, this is the I conformation, and in that, there you have clearly moved into a nonlinear regime. Well, you can also do this experiment for stars. And here's a star DNA that's just floating at the moment. And if it's, there's not much field on it, it tends to be actually pretty much balled up. But when you apply the field, you can, it, it linearly stretches out. And what you see is that the star DNA moving through solution does that arms first, body behind. Why? Right, we, because the chains, the matrix chains, trap here and slow down the middle the most. Now, if the field gets weaker and weaker, this stretch effect gets less and less, but if you're in the linear regime, the first little bit of field will still give you the arms lead a teeny tiny bit and the um, body la lags behind. How can we describe this motion? Well, I'm going to give a word for it. The word is teuthidic. And unless you actually learnt, studied Latin, which I, under modern conditions is unlikely, you will not immediately recognize that the teuthidae are the squids. A squid is this, or octopus, is this animal that lives underwater. They're also so calamari, if you go to Italian restaurants. And calamari look like this, and they typically swim like this. Well, many of them swim like that. Some of them swim like this. But I'm talking about the ones that chase their prey like this, arms first. And you get little squid that take little fish. And you have really large squid that go after whales, or at least try to. And there was one unfortunate case of one that attempted to go after an American nuclear submarine. Of course, it couldn't damage it. But it has this nice sharp beak, and the front end of the nuclear submarine is the plastic sonar dome that got chewed up. Let's not think about this from the taxpayer position. But in any event, the motion is teuthidic. Our ends of arms first, center of the molecule trailing. Um, this picture is totally different from the entanglement reputation picture I talked about last time, except this is direct observation. You can, however, still believe in reputation. All you have to say is, these pictures show a pseudo-linear regime. If you were actually in the linear regime, you'd see something different. However, I see I am out of time. Class is dismissed. OK. And if you are wondering why I sort of stand there at the front and the end, I, do the vid I have to edit the video, and it is really convenient if at the front and the end I have this nice section where I am just standing there smiling and not moving with my mouth shut, so it looks okay on the video.
Okay, we're done. And Monday, you should have made, next by next Monday, you need to have made significant progress on that homework assignment, at least to discover how all of those li references I gave you, literature,